Well, I'm so happy to be connecting with you, Alexandra. This is like our first time speaking in this way, even though we've spoken in other ways and I've had multiple interactions here on the interwebs. <laughs> I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself, just to um, have people get to know you if they haven't met you yet. I'm really excited to start this conversation. I feel like we have so much to talk about, but I would love for you to just share a little bit about yourself if that feels okay. Yeah, I would like to, I would like to thank you, Edgar, for meeting me here in this in this space and um yeah. i i'm i'm a big fan as you may know i have some of your works in my collection uh i'm alexandra kraus i'm originally from the netherlands but uh, i've been living in a small country of belgium for 20 years now um i'm working primarily with digital media and mostly uh my core business is 3d animation so i often make these big, immersive, very slow uh, installations that are meant to trap people. So uh, I'm not going to be shy about this. I like to trap people. I used to paint, uh, but I got a bit frustrated with painting being too restricted to a canvas and too restricted to one image, a single image at a time. So this is why I started making animations, which are sometimes thousands of images. <laughs> At the time, I am interested in working with deep time. I like to connect back into time to the origins of art making, but I also look forward to uh, possible futures. And I think that has been lingering in the background for a long time is a deep sense of worry about our ecological and climatological uh, state of the earth. And uh, I am trying to deal with this mounting anxiety, anxiety that, uh, that this is coming over me. And by helping myself, I am also attempting to help you. <laughs> right. uh, but I'm, I'm not very qualified. I am in some ways a bit of a charlatan, <laughs> a bit of a quack. <laughs> but I, I feel visual arts provides the space to be acting as an artistic quack. So I love that. <laughs> I, I guard that. I guard my my cracking boundaries very, very fiercely. Uh, I've been working on a PhD in art uh, for the last three years, which involves actually this, this dealing with eco-anxiety. Uh, I deal with uh, an actual piece of land, which was also for me a surprise because I'm so used to working with uh, digital pieces of, of virtual land. Right. Uh, a small bit of family land that uh, was a forest until a couple of years ago, which died because of the bark beetle plague that has been uh, ravaging European, but also American forests uh, the last decade. Please stop me before I go on. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you, like, I'd love for you if you wouldn't mind sharing like what deep time means for you and um, how you connect with it in your work. I am a, I'm t I'm a terrible nerd. Uh, when I was a child, I did uh, talks in school and presentations about dinosaurs. So I think um, that's when this idea of time, of not being constrained to your own time, Mm -hmm. um, kind of took seed, uh, and I became gradually more and more interested in our own human history. I mean, how, how did we get here? Why are we here? What happened? And um, especially the origins of art making, because that is most of what is left of us, the, the, the tools that we have. I showed it before a bit, but I will show it for the recording again. Uh, this is actually not a very old one, but this is a stone scraper, probably just seven or eight thousand years old, which is not that old. Um, and it, it appears very much like a sort of computer mouse with this strange dots on it. And I have that here on my desk as a reminder of this connection to our origins as, as artists, but also as humans. Is that piece that you have there, is that a replica or is that an actual? No, that is, that's, a, that's an actual one. You would be surprised how cheap they are. We made, I keep referring to uh, we, because it's us, we had the same right. rate. We made so many 
<laughs> so so they're actually not that expensive. I got yeah. I got a guy who I got, got some... <laughs> you have a connection, yes. I have, I have a connection. I got a dealer. My, my dealer, he, <laughs> he provides me with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I love this thing that you bring up, this notion that, you know, what is left behind or what what survives, right, all this time. And I think that that's something that um, a lot of people are thinking about, and especially, you know, with artists who work with archives or who work with even like I'm thinking about like speculative like imagining histories right and I think um there's so much that we um in a sense like you know come to understand just because of these things that survive these things that are still left behind and I'd love to hear is this something that you were saying that you started when you were young be, with dinosaurs is that kind of your first like uh, you know um awe, awe moment of like wow there's so much time behind me and then kind of starting to understand all the other um you know eons and and, and periods and <laughs> time that um, have existed or, or are there other reasons why you kind of started to get excited about deep time and um, thinking about time in this way? Well, there's a, obviously because there are just these bits and pieces of of time left in the shape of uh, objects and, and utensils and, and this leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So right. indeed, in a way you can and this becomes a bit complicated sometimes when it comes to um, uh, history classes, for instance, because history always can tell just this very, very narrow part of what happened. The canon always just keeps uh, amplifying itself. So you have to try to look beyond that and go back to the smaller things. I, I have a collection of like really small 16th century uh, cooking pots, for instance, which is mm. just great to have. Um, but this idea of of trying, because it also reminds us of how little is left of us after we go. Right. When 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 this life is gone, we just leave a bunch of stuff that most of it is is thrown away, <laughs> and and that is a bit of a shock. And in a lot of way, it's also it, it's what has happened all of our lives, and most of it just disappears. And that disappearance of, of, of things, of species, of landscapes, of that whole flux that moves, I find that, I find that incredibly fascinating because you can learn so much from what you can grasp in bits and pieces from the past while at the same time interpreting it, it in various ways. And the question is always, how do you wrap that into this neat package that you can bring moving forward into right. the future. And I've been making a lot of works that deal with future visions, more or less. They were usually quite bleak <laughs> and quite empty. I, I am not uh, a people's person per se. I am actually uh, introvert. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, uh, so maybe maybe that's why I like to imagine a world where there are no people. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and also, I grew up in the countryside, whatever that would mean in the area where I am. It's not really that country, <laughs> the countryside right. where I'm from, but at least with, with some fields and forests and, and animals surrounding me. And I've been living most of my life now in uh, a city, uh, one of the most urban areas of, of, uh, of Europe. And my view um, has been rooftops and walls and facades and all that. And I am building like souvenir boxes, like memories. I'm building landscapes that are long forgotten or may come in the future. Empty, endless landscapes with much horizon as a sort of compensation. So mm, I also wow. have, uh, I, I have a very, um, deep connection also with my with my computer with the screen so this connection of screen culture and the screen as a window to the world but also as a as a glass that separates me from these endless x y and z axes of my 3d software which i'm building in a way i'm a world builder that 
connects also to the idea of habitat dioramas, the dioramas of the American Museum of Natural History, for instance, those American history, uh, right. natural history dioramas in these museums, that are these cases behind glass that are simulations of views and wilderness. Um, I was actually in New York when the first lockdown hit. I was supposed to be in New York for two months, but I flew back to Brussels in two weeks because of the lockdowns. In those two weeks, I had the opportunity to visit the American Museum of Natural History a couple of times. And it's just the transportation, um, the sense of transportation you get when you're in the city of in one of the biggest, biggest urban mythological cities in the world. And you are standing there, you're looking at a prairie with a sunset. And it is eerily real and it is marvelous and it is still and it is it is and you, and you, can, you can almost look around the corner because it's so three-dimensional right. i once explained my work to be this really almost sick weird kind of nature conservation that i'm doing mm. especially since now i'm using photogrammetry in which i and I also have the LiDAR scanner on my phone that you can, it looks like you're, you're actually healing somebody, but you're like scanning right. an object. Like tracing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you're, you're like, I, I compare that uh, process to the Greek mythology of uh, Charon. Charon, hey, I saw a flash of lightning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Charon is the, uh, the pharaoh who brings the souls of the dead to the, uh, to the deceased, for, of the deceased over the river Styx to the realm of the dead. And making a copy, a digital copy of something in the real world and transporting it to this digital realm feels a bit similar. Like you're, you're making these small copies to try to preserve them. And some of my models I have put on the blockchain in the hopes that uh, Tezos blockchain will outlast me at least a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that what you're naming that, um, you know, I, we were talking earlier before we started recording this idea of, you know, what's left over and, and what people leave and what we and now in our culture have as like the origins of art making, right? And I think a lot about, you know, in your work, especially this idea between the simulacra and the real, the authentic, and then also, you know, what you're naming too around, um, you know, you called yourself like a charlatan and, you know, this desire to, um, you know, tr you know, trap people or, or get people. And I think a lot about just like how in our contemporary day and age, we're, you know, really pushed to, um, have things be really quick and fast and and there isn't much time in a sense for reflection or for um, looking at things in a in a different way that allows us to kind of uh, be um, you know really feel the sense of of time passing or the sense of um, the depth of different things and uh, you know your desire to create these uh, simulated spaces that will outlast you know on the blockchain and um, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are of the blockchain and how you maybe got started in working um, with Tezos and working um, uh, with with crypto art in general. Yeah that was just such a surprise. Um... Years ago, ages ago, I, I, I'm, I'm quite explorative when it comes to digital stuff, but I, used, I, I had a computer that would try to mine Bitcoin um, and then it crashed and I didn't care and nobody cared for Bitcoin. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, and I completely forgot about that. Too much, too many numbers. It, it uh, reminded me a lot about uh, of uh, too much of uh, accounting, which is not my hobby. <laughs> so um, I was teaching a course, uh, digital dimensions. It was called for um, animation students in Brussels. This people thing happened, and I. I didn't really understand what it had to do with me because the work of people was not exactly up my alley, right. to put it politely, but right. I, it was a digital dimension. And I felt obligated to my students 
whether they felt the need or not to dive into that. And uh, I started to read about it. And first I was reading for a couple of hours and then my head was spinning and then I was reading for a whole day. And then I was like, Pfft. and then I was reading more. And I think I read for two weeks, well, not, not like nonstop, but in between about blockchains. And at this exact moment, Hikat Nunk came about the platform, the first platform that you could use to mint on Tezos. Mm -hmm. And because I also found out about these, um, these uh, through these articles by Memo Acton, for instance, about the ecological costs of Ethereum. Uh, oh, the merge is coming soon, by the way. I'm yeah. very curious how that will work out. But I'm, I'm yeah, really we all are. I think, yeah. Finally. It provided me a reason to try it because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do it because of the ecological cost. My work is about ecological breakdown. I cannot, in good conscience, try to work with that if I have with the knowledge that I, uh, I right. acquired back then. So I just started on Hicket Nunk. Coincidentally, or maybe not, my uh, artistic twin, Kenny Richards, Kelly Richardson, in uh, Vancouver Island in Canada, we are, um, we are artistically connected very much so we also met uh, in, in the real world uh, at an exhibition that we were both doing actually twice she made exactly the same journey so we started a conversation in which we were like learning from each other and between the both of us we actually kind of acquired a lot of gossip <laughs> and uh, and and a lot of knowledge so um and she's also the one that i we, we would ask how how many editions should we make and how much should we ask and all these like really really basic questions because the market a market in general was a very strange place for me my work commercially i mean it never did anything it had, ne had nothing to do with markets it only existed in uh, an exhibition space and with help of um external funding so this was quite ex exciting that we were in there together and quite quickly uh, when you start collecting also other people's work your network just expands and you immediately recognize quality in the works of people that you have never heard of you don't know anything about i mean you are there with your own name but there are a lot of people who are there anonymously that you right. gradually get to know and then you understand oh this is this young kids from brazil and oh he's doing such an awesome job and you get really excited because in a way most digital artists are also self-taught i was never that was when i was in art school i mean i'm 48 when i was in art school there was no classes in in this thing i like i mentioned maybe before i was trained as a painter i learned because i'm an artist. i learned the computer and i understood it by myself and most of us are like that because it just was so new and there we find also this like this tension between what people are referring to which still also sounds weird to me traditional art world and the nft space there are a lot of non-artists in the nft space but there's also a lot of artists that have never really felt home at home in the traditional art world because we had to do everything ourselves and we were not we're not often very well understood like is this art but how so what do you do with it and and, and uh, I think that brings up something really interesting that you know I really resonate with a lot where I feel like before I started putting my art on the blockchain like I I personally feel like I diminished the value of my digital work and um, saw it as very ephemeral saw it as something that only existed for the social media or for these moments that you know and then once it was done it's done and it's in the archive and and for me I think one thing that was really big and I would love to hear your experience was I started to actually then come to understand you know my digital output as an artist as a big part of my cultural practice as my art practice and and seeing how much it's influenced any all these other parts of my work and that was a big shift for me and um i i've also come to understand that like i did a really bad job at archiving a lot of my digital art because i didn't see it as um something that was going to last and and i think that that you know i think about what you were saying earlier about when people died 
so many things get thrown away and uh, this like almost like cultural way of existing where certain things are you know seen as not valuable or seen as not existing for longer periods and so I'd love to hear how this um, maybe was for you and especially you know I think with what you were just saying around a lot of the stuff that we've been doing has been self-taught hasn't been recognized by institutions <laughs> hasn't been like uh, sold through institutions um, and it doesn't fit into many categories in many ways. Mm -hmm. I, I recognize that completely. Well, not entirely. Um, a lot of my work was already digital, but I made a very, I, I made these big installations, big projections, uh, um, mostly. And I would like embellish them with a lot of physical works, like prints right. and textiles. And I, because I felt that it, galleries would also say, well, then we have something to sell, you know, because you don't sell a video, rarely you do. So, uh, and works on paper, which, I mean, I love paper, but I'm just, just really terrible. You have to think how big, which kind of paper, what kind of material does it have to be framed? How do, how to hang it? Oh, damn, the frame has fallen. All this glass, you know, this is that, that. <laughs> the blockchain, the NFT solved that problem partly. And a lot of the things that I really thought, indeed, those are things that I'm just doing. Like I have uh, made, um, two emoji proposals for uh, Unicode, one for uh, Stone Tool, one for the hand stencil, which is actually the first pictogram. They were both declined and I, I knew they are part of my work, but I couldn't validate that until the blockchain. And mm. those smaller things, my body of work, as it turns out, is so much bigger than I initially thought. And I've gained so much more confidence also to say this PDF is a work. This photogrammetric model is a work. I don't need to right. put it in a film to become a work. It is the model is the work. I find that incredibly liberating. And this is also what this, this whole connecting to the, all these wonderful new people and new faces like you has done. I have grown in my confidence as an artist because I know now that I'm not an isolated island, but I am with all these people who have experienced the same thing. And yesterday I had a talk in my uh, show with Gambrood, uh, who is a Dutch uh, artist, and uh, Jan Robert Leegte, who is not on Teasers, but he is working with um, uh, art blocks, uh, about the, the solidarity we all feel towards each other, because we are venturing into something unknown altogether. We don't know where this ends up. I mean, I really understand the caution institutions have towards the whole uh, archival, how that will work out in the future of the blockchain. Right. Right. But on the other hand, at this moment, we are the ones with the most practical knowledge of some something that has emerged, that is a very dynamical field, and that is moving in a complete contrast to deep time with a new kind of time, NFT time, which is right. a bit sometimes. Yeah, and there's so much unknown, as you're saying, in that space. And um, I love what you're sharing around the expanding of our networks and, you know, getting inspired by each other, feeling supported by each other. I'm definitely thinking to myself, like, what are other ways that... Um, I maybe invalidate certain practices of mine or don't see certain practices of mine as real or relevant until they're like, you know, as you're saying, connected to something or have a physical component. There's ways that I feel like we're unlearning and relearning other uh, ways of sharing our work. And I think this, you know, makes me want to um, talk a little bit about your most recent exhibition, um, NGMI, or, you know, which is an acronym that's used a lot in the, you know, crypto world and Web3. I uh, would love for you to talk a little bit about it and, you know, what it means for you, uh, and especially, you know, around uh, some of the things that we're talking about, that uncertainty, the unknown, uh, both in terms of, like, our world where we are, but also, 
not knowing like what this big experiment that we're all doing, like where it's going to lead. Yeah, I would love to hear you share about your exhibition and also, yeah, what this word means, because some people might not know what NGMI means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I, I, I also write quite a lot. So I publish in a Belgian art magazine and I have a column on, on uh, digital art and NFT uh, uh, just to make clear that I'm very language sensitive, not only for the Dutch language, but also English language. And with entering this world and uh, swimming in the same flow as crypto bros, a completely <laughs> alien species to me, <laughs> has enriched my vocabulary with many, many interesting new terms. And um, NGMI means not going to make it. Uh, and it's often used uh, for bad investments in the crypto space. But I'm using it to say something about the post-pandemic situation we are in now in relation to the climatological and ecological system crisis. Um, the opposite of NGMI is WAGMI, <laughs> W-A-G-M-I. We all got to make it. And um, yeah, doubtful. But <laughs> we'll see. Where to start? Um, I, I, I work alone, so I don't really have, I don't work with a, a script or a screenplay or anything like that. I just start. And um, I've noticed throughout the years that um, my films are often made in chapters and the spaces between those chapters uh, are just as important as the chapters themselves. So there's chapters with some sort of action, with something that more or less resembles a story from A to B. And then in between that, there's the also, okay, you have to mellow down a little bit and then it moves up again. So they are like this. MGMI itself is a 12 minute film, a vertical film, which is incredibly stupid because it's vertical. I cannot send it to film festivals. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, why? But I had this idea in mind that I wanted to be, I wanted it to be a monolith and it worked up to something that I wanted to have in there. I wanted to have a speech, a speech by an avatar that I make and some sort of oracle. She is at the same time really annoying and quite funny and it is me. And it is, it is a way to use myself and text into, in the film, because I, I don't want, I'm, I'm an animator, I'm not using my, me, me. That, that would be, uh, so, um, uh, so that was the core of it, the, and that person, that, that avatar was meant to bring bad news. It's just, how, how do you convey bad news to people who do not want to hear it, because, it is, it is going to be tough and we, we can all do something about it, but we have to face this danger that we are in. We have to tackle it head on. But first, all self-help trajectories say it, acknowledge that there is a problem. <laughs> so the whole exhibition is like a slap in the face of the viewer, acknowledge that there's a problem. It's just very confusing because I'm doing this with very soft colors, a lot of pink, bean bags, soothing music. <laughs> so it's just it's it's just one big contradictory um, exhibition, uh, which which I like. All this ambiguity of the whole thing, this confusedness of the whole situation that is out there, is artistically wrapped into a series of animations, um, a space that. Uh, resembles a new age healing room with the bean bags and pink lights and a really mellow soundtrack. Um, I love my iPad, by the way. I've learned to work with Garage Band, and I'm totally into making mellow, <laughs> mellow sound <laughs> soundscapes. Yeah, exactly. It all calms me down. <laughs> uh, and um, and then there's these these letters on the wall projected and in a vertical film again vertical on a flat screen with this this hand that is a trope from religions all over. You try to touch the sky and it says, "Admit it. Just say it. It's us. <laughs> we we did this. Acknowledge it." 
own it, embody it very slowly, like it's trying to indoctrinate it into you. Some people got really upset by the space, uh, but th that just means it, that it's job, I suppose. Um, and I also yeah. feel quite, I always feel very conflicted about my work. In some cases, I, I think, how, what was I thinking? <laughs> and in other <laughs> cases, I'm, I'm like, oh, this is genius. <laughs> <Did I? laughs> so uh, I won't really know how to place the exhibition maybe until a couple of months, although I got a good feeling about it. I love that you're creating a space for confusion, for ambiguity. I think that those are really important elements in a time where, as you're naming, there is so much like denial, so much um, delusion, and so much certainty too, and people who are so polarized in terms of what they believe, or what they don't believe. And mm -hmm. I feel like art is such a powerful conduit for that space of contemplation of confusion, and also of as what you're saying of radical acceptance, which it's not easy, it's uncomfortable, and I love that you're, you know, seeing anger as, you know, a, an appropriate response, right? It's, it is angering that there's so much information out there that isn't telling us this, that we're still, like, you know, there's so many campaigns being made, there's so many things being created that, like, don't focus on the fact that, you know, climate catastrophe is so present in this moment you know it's already here and yeah it, and it's not something that's comfortable to sit with right it is it is uh it is disheartening to say the least and it's also um it makes you feel so powerless and that is a that is a terrible feeling uh because i'm i'm acutely aware that by making an exhibition for my audience that i'm not reaching the people that have something to say about this the people making policies, but it is the only amplifier that I have the exhibition space. And I think as artists to use cultural leverage, I called it to make change uh, could could be used a bit better. Um, I think a lot of uh, the art world is still very much focused on either markets or on um, personal smaller issues instead of showing that things can be different. Um, it doesn't, it, it, this is deviant from what you see outside of the art space. And this is good, this is also here, it exists. So it shows by being there, simply being there, it shows things can be different. Um, and I think that that leverage is still, because where I'm standing, uh, politics and industries have failed us, so in this experiment, as you rightfully called it, why not try art as one of the paths to, to follow? Yeah, and I think that also, you know, kind of makes me think of uh, what you said at the beginning of this conversation, this, uh, you know, trapping of people, of being a charlatan, and the importance of there being people who can uh, speak different languages, right, who can work with, because I think I'm thinking about your aesthetic and the way that your, you know, animation aesthetic has been used by crypto bros or by corporations, right, and then to use that same aesthetic to create a different experience to me that that's part of the like charlatan energy i think and and in entrapment you can also in a call way. it wizard, wizardry is fine too <laughs> wizardry exactly yeah magic that creating an experience that is transformative and and also brings to question the usage of these practices by other people because i think that's to me as uh, someone who practices magic as identifies as a witch one of the biggest things for me that was shocking was that coming to realize that governments practice witchcraft, that corporations practice witchcraft, that capitalism is a big spell. Like there yes. are ways that like we are already being acted upon and trapped already by the system. And so yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this if you have any. <laughs> Well, I think you're absolutely right. The realization that we are all, in a way, very easily manipulated into whatever is being the most dominant manipulator at that point in time. 
if you are aware of that and with us being artists and actually being part of manipulating because we know what manipulating images and text what that means because we're doing it and using that to uh, to amplify yes this this other message this other side this this alternative universe that is there too that is within reach if you just allow it to be there i think we we could be well it depends of course on where you are in the world i mean there are obviously places where you don't really get a voice as an artist so you are more or less subdued to propaganda which is the wizardry and magic and charlatanism uh used by those powers that be right and in the area where I am, which is one of the most wealthiest areas also in, in the world, and the most ecologically poor areas, we are in, in really in need of, <laughs> of help, <laughs> but despite that wealth, that so-called right. wealth. Right. Um, the artists have been made compliant by uh, telling them to just be, be good with the market, just play with the market. So you have a big a uh, chunk of artists that are just making really nice paintings for the market. It's, it's very similar to the NFT world in that sense. And I am uh, part sometimes of a committee of the Flemish government. Flanders is the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. It's a complicated story where I'm part of a committee of uh, individual artist grants uh, um, applications. And you can tell with these committees that we are all a bit tired of art for the sake of art. We need more, we, we want more out of it. When does escapism become activism? Those kinds of things. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to like be as literal and be as uh, direct as, as I am. It's just a little bit more awareness to use this cultural leverage that we have. I have a beautiful, beautiful quote by Bill McKibben, who wrote mm. uh, in 1990, yeah, 1989, he wrote um, uh, The End of Nature. In 2005, he wrote as, uh, an essay called what the, world, what the World Needs Now is Art Sweet Art. And he says, we're living through the biggest thing that has happened since human civilization emerged. Our species has by itself, in the course of a couple of generations, managed to powerfully raise the temperature of an entire planet to knock its most basic systems out of kilter. But oddly, though we know about it, we don't know about it. It hasn't registered in our gut. It isn't part of our culture. And he asks, where are the books? the poems, the plays, the goddamn operas. And then he continues, he's American, compare it to say the horror of AIDS in the last two decades, which has produced the staggering outpouring of art that in turn has had real political effect. I mean, when people someday look back on our moment, the single most significant item will doubtless be the sudden spiking temperature, but they'll have a hell of a time figuring out what it meant to us. I find that if you are talking also about memories and moving back and forth in time, right. a very, also maybe part of of what I want to do I want I want people to know in the future that we knew this is also what is hidden in some of the tapestries I, I made a couple of years ago there are temperature graphs uh, in there and co2 levels in there and rising sea levels they are hidden but a researcher a couple of centuries from now will find those uh, clues and they will say they knew, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and thinking back to the title, you know, of, you know, NGMI, not going to make it and thinking of, like you were saying, the, the, the presence of crypto bros in the in the <laughs> uh, Web three space, like I think I am so grateful to meet people like you and other artists in the space who are creating artwork that is layered in meaning, that is really um, you know personal, that is also about the collective, and that is engaging with these really intense, powerful, researched um, ideas that you know, 
can be very easily dismissed, you know, because I think a lot about like how, you know, the projects in Web3 that make it are like many times like projects that have no meaning behind them or, you know, yeah. it's just something that's beautiful or that is collectible yeah. and a lot of how- talk about aesthetics and uh, technology itself and techniques actually, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. You said you want to you want to talk about that. Oh no, no, no. I'm 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 agreeing with you. Sorry, I interrupted. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think um, the importance of creating work as an artist, even if it means that it's not financially successful, if it doesn't make sense in the market, if it doesn't make sense even culturally, uh, I think it is important for artists to really know that it's it's so valuable for you to follow that you know desire to have an impact to leave your imprint and to also tell the future that you know we knew we were having these conversations we were talking about it we were creating artwork about it and that we were here right we were here in this space uh, mm -hmm. trying to process something that is so big something yeah. that is so um, really big. so big <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's, it's very big yeah i uh I, angie my I don't want to lose hope, so I'm holding on to like smaller strings, and it is also in a way, you know, humor is a, a coping mechanism. So I made this NGMI anthem, which is at the same time just heartbreaking, but also really kitschy and funny, and I would <laughs> love to have like a children's choir sing it in front of a oh my shell, an oil company headquarters. Wow, oh my goodness. If somebody will, will see this recording and knows how to do that, please get in touch. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure to um, provide your contact information in case people want to reach out to you to have this vision come into fruition because that would yeah, be so yeah. powerful and yeah, I think yeah and there's something that's also I think about reclaiming uh, power with words and reclaiming power in moments of feeling helpless in moments of feeling like there's not much you could do I think as as you're saying as people who have cultural leverage as people who are engaged in a cultural dialogue that is some place where we can have impact right and it can make yeah. us at least feel a little bit of control in a time where it does feel like yeah there's it's such a big thing that we have no way of impacting we can at least use the tools we have right <laughs> yeah. create yeah, an exactly. impact yeah and this is also what I love about your work that because you're also dealing with big things and then it's so interesting to me that you're incorporating your heritage in there which is such a big difference when you're living in Europe I mean we we are all indigenous us us white Europeans we we don't have this concept of of um, we were the colonizers, but we don't have the concept of being colonized or being on somebody else's land. And I find that endlessly fascinating. And I can tell that uh, from Australia to Canada to the United States, that there's much more recognition towards also these really big issues, because at the moment uh, where Kelly Richardson is living in Vancouver Island, logging companies are logging a thousand year old trees on land that is not theirs that nobody said they could use and this is this is so this whole ecology and the colonization becomes completely entangled and one makes the big issue even bigger to tackle right. which makes it also interesting and complicated and uh, exciting and everything all, <laughs> all contradictory emotions at the same time definitely yeah and I think there is so important to um, you know bring these conversations into different spaces even for example this is going to exist on YouTube and like I think about how uh, important it is to have these kinds of conversations in different platforms and different spaces where they will reach and touch multiple people who maybe don't know about what's mm -hmm. happening in, in these places where land is being taken. Uh, I think it's so important to create portals, you know, to create pathways into understanding 
the interrelatedness, the complexity, the layers that exist behind these massive systems and how we are implicated, you know, in, and many times without our consent, right, how we are implicated yeah. with these systems. And, um, and thank you for what you said about me bringing in my Indigenous ancestry, because it, it feels really resonant with what, you know, we're sharing, where it's like, I think a big part for me too, is like wanting to, uh, bring some of this uh, knowledge and wisdom and tradition and also exploration and experimentation to into these spaces where they're not going to have a voice they're not going to be seen they're not going to exist maybe they're not even expected to exist in these spaces and so I think it's so important for us to use these technologies these spaces that we have to create these messages for people uh, because we don't know what the future holds for us and we don't know what, you know, for example, the crypto art world is going to look like in 10 years. We don't know how people will be engaging with that. And yet our work will maybe exist there still, right? And so... Oh, oh I hope so. I, I, th I, th I think it will. I think it will. In, in 10 years, oh, for sure. But I am so curious as to it, the developments and then the coming merge of, of Ethereum and the Beacon Chain. And the, even though I'm not on Ethereum, I'm just, and everybody's like, what is going to happen there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in a big moment of transition, of change. And we don't, and in a way, we're recording this right before it happens. So we'll see what it's like you know, by the time we upload this, <laughs> by yeah. the time that this is released. Um, yeah, so much change. And so I'd love to, for you to share if people want to connect with you, if people want to see more of your work, uh, what are, and I'm definitely going to link some links here in this video, but I would love for you to share ways that folks can connect with you and your artwork. The most information can be found on my website um www.alexandrakraus.com i have a terrible name for american speakers the alexandra part is okay but the crowers sounds like a crow crowers americans alex crowers uh, <laughs> t-r-w-o-u-r but wait c-r-o-u-w-e-r-s you will write it down there and then and, i'm on instagram i'm on twitter i'm mostly active on on instagram oh wait that reminds me do you mind if i take a quick picture of you yeah that'd be wonderful <laughs> thank you and i i not only have my portfolio website but i have like loads of websites but all the links are at the bottom of my website and i've got a link tree in my uh, instagram uh, links and twitter links so i'm i'm quite easily reachable wonderful if, if people want to know more they can find me also because there's nobody with the same name as me so that helps <laughs> That really helps. Yeah. Well, it's so great to connect with you and so wonderful to talk. And I, you know, really look forward to future conversations because I know this yeah, isn't the too. only time we're going to talk. <laughs> so oh, really, I love this. Yeah, same. It's been so wonderful to get to um, know each other a little bit more and to connect and um, just looking forward to staying in touch and collecting more of your work because I'm like also so grateful to have some of your artwork in my collection too. Oh, same here. Likewise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>